Hello and welcome to another edition of Bread Theory. My name is Zach, and I'm your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And tonight joining me once again is my wife, Amanda. She goes by the streaming name perennial underscore green. How are you doing tonight, Amanda? I'm doing well. How are you? Not too bad. What's been going on in perennial green lately? Uh, we made a terrarium yesterday. Oh, what kind of terrarium was that? A cacti succulent terrarium. It was pretty fun. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So go check out perennial underscore green if you want to learn a whole lot about house plants and craft projects and, and stuff, ways you can make your, your home look, you know, like, like you see in the background there. But tonight we're not going to talk so much about plants uh, as much as we're going to continue on with chapters 7 and 8 of The Conquest of Bread uh, by Peter Kropotkin. And the reason we're doing two chapters tonight is the first one's only a little over five minutes long. It's pretty short. It's on clothing. So uh, mostly he just is going to rehash some of his ideas from previous chapters and just apply them to clothing. So I guess he decided that it didn't need to be quite as in-depth or as long. So uh, are you, you all set to go? I am. Well, let's get right into the chapter for tonight then. And here we go. Should be going. Nope, it's not. There we go. Boy, Houses average. have become the common heritage of the citizens, and when each man has his daily supply of food, another forward step will have to be taken. The question of clothing will, of course, demand consideration next, and again, the only possible solution will be to take possession, in the name of the people, of all the shops and warehouses where clothing is sold or stored, and to throw open the doors to all so that each can take what he needs. The communalization of clothing, the right of each to take what he needs from the communal stores or to have it made for him at the tailors and outfitters, is a necessary corollary of the communalization of houses and food. Obviously, we shall not need for that to despoil all citizens of their coats, to put all the garments in a heap and draw lots for them, as our critics, with equal wit and ingenuity, suggest. Let him who has a coat keep it still, nay, if he have ten coats, it is highly improbable that anyone will want to deprive him of them. So we're seeing some of the same ideas as with the distribution of housing, where you don't just put everything in one big pile. That's very inefficient. Uh, it would take the, you know, the entire efforts of everybody who's you know, doing other things like trying to cook food and, and procure other necessities of life to, to come together to put everything in a uh, pile and, and kind of draw what they want from it. So instead... You know, if you got coats, good for you. Uh, if you have extra coats, you should probably try and, and donate them to um, some common place where you can uh, have them redistributed. And uh, other than that, the focus is production, of course. So focusing on getting people who don't have adequate uh, clothing, the, the, the shoes, the, the coats, the whatever they need, and uh, continue on from there. Any, any thoughts on that so far? I actually have quite a bit to add about this chapter, but I think I want to save it for the end. Okay. You can speak up a little bit, too. For a new coat to one that has already graced the shoulders of some fat bourgeois. And there will be enough new garments and to spare without having recourse to secondhand wardrobes. If we were to take an inventory of all the clothes and stuff for clothing accumulated in the shops and stores of the large towns, we should find probably that in Paris, Lyon, Bordeaux, and Marseille, there was enough to enable the commune to offer garments to all the citizens of both sexes. And if all were not suited at once, the communal outfitters would soon make good these shortcomings. We know how rapidly our great tailoring and dressmaking establishments work nowadays, provided as they are with machinery specially adapted for production on a large scale. But everyone Even will want a stable line coat or a velvet gown, exclaim our adversaries. Frankly, we do not believe it. Every woman does not dote on velvet, nor does every man dream of sable linings. Even now, if we were to ask each woman to choose her gown, we should find some to prefer a simple, practical garment to all the fantastic trimmings the fashionable world affects. I, I think this holds true today. People aren't, you know, I mean, as much as consumer culture would like us to believe that people are really focused on the absolute finest in life and that that's all that they will, uh, that, that, that's all that's... Um, desirable people just want stuff that works first and foremost they want um things that are going to get them through the winter things that are going to be waterproof when they need it and 
uh, you know, insulating and breathable when, or breathable when they don't want it to be that way. So, yeah, not, not everyone's going to just demand the highest, fanciest stuff. And in fact, there'll probably be a, a much less of a demand for the, the fancier stuff, not only because it may require supply lines that may have broken down, broken down after revolution, you know, if, especially if you're talking about things like silk or, or other very specialized materials, uh, furs, stuff like that. Uh, but also because people are just going to be focused on other things, you know, it's, it's not, you know, after a revolution, people don't really have too much of an eye on fashion. It's just kind of one of those things that uh, you focus on when you have your other needs met and it just kind of goes by the wayside, I, I would imagine, once, uh, you know, you have other more pressing matters to attend to. So let's move on with the times and the fashion in vogue at the time of the revolution will certainly make for simplicity. Societies like individuals have their hours of cowardice, but also their heroic moments. And though the society of today cuts a very poor figure sunk in the pursuit of narrow personal interests and second-rate ideas, it wears a different air when great crises come. It has its moments of greatness and enthusiasm. Men of a generous nature will gain the power which today is in the hand of jobbers. Self-devotion will spring up and noble deeds beget their like. Even the egotists will be ashamed of hanging back and will be drawn in spite of themselves to admire, if not to imitate, the generous and brave. The Great Revolution of 1793 abounds in examples of this kind, and it is ever during such times of spiritual revival, as nature to societies as to individuals, that the spring tide of enthusiasm sweeps humanity onwards. We do not wish to exaggerate the part played by such noble passions, nor is it upon them that we would found our ideal society. But we are not asking too much if we expect their aid in tiding over the first and most difficult moments. We cannot hope that our daily life will be continuously inspired by such exalted enthusiasms, but we may expect their aid at the first, and that is all we need. It is just to wash the earth clean, to sweep away the shards and refuse, accumulated by centuries of slavery and oppression, that the new anarchist society will have need of this wave of brotherly love. Later on, it can exist without appealing to the spirit of self-sacrifice, because it will have eliminated oppression, and thus created a new world instinct with all the feelings of solidarity. Besides, should the character of the revolution be such as we have sketched here, the free initiative of individuals would find an extensive field of action in thwarting the efforts of the egotists. Groups would spring up in every street and quarter to undertake the charge of the clothing. They would make inventories of all that the city possessed and would find out approximately what were the resources at their disposal. It this is one of those, those parts that Kropotkin, he just kind of writes a sketch for an idea, but it's it's not completely fleshed out. He just says groups are spontaneously going to, to form to work on the distribution and then the production of clothing and make sure that, that all needs are met. And that, that may be very well true. People have a, a good tendency to kind of self-organize, especially in times of crisis and stuff like that. But he's not really saying, you know, how you're going to make sure that, you know, one person doesn't use that sort of a power for, you know, extracting favors from other people or, or something like that. So his, he kind of just seems to think that uh, everything, because everyone has been convinced of the, the goodness and the rightness of the revolution, or at least enough people that they can, you know, kind of suppress the egoists, as he puts them, the people that would, would seek to profiteer in, in times of crisis that overall things are just going to, you know, smooth out, that, that there won't be production hoarding or, or resource hoarding of any kind, that people are going to uh, just rely on one another for mutual aid, basically, to, to see them through. And, I mean, if you have enough of a spirit of, of solidarity, I think that's definitely possible. Uh, but, I mean, for my money, that, that sort of thing has to be built up ahead of time. You can't just come to a, a time of great crisis, have a, a big overturning of power, and then just hope that things come out that way. I think people really have to be primed ahead of time to just start thinking in that way. I think one, one good way to do that is to imagine a family. A family is basically a mutual aid group, or at least that, that tends to be how the family functions. People aren't expected to do more work than they're capable of. Uh, and even if they sometimes don't do a whole lot of work at all, they still get all the resources they need for their daily lives. They still help each other out to start enterprises, to 
you know, kind of reach their highest and best selves just by being a part of that family. So I think if you just start with that, that image in your head or that conception in your head and just kind of start extending it out to say maybe your neighbors that live on your block uh, or your floor if you live in an apartment complex and then extend that out a little bit more, you know, and a little bit more to the, to the point where you're up to about a neighborhood size. And that tends to be about the largest size that, that humans, you know, that they've come up with some mathematical calculations to determine this, but a neighborhood's about the biggest size that you can kind of keep everyone filed in your head as you, you know, even if you can't place a name to every face you see, at least, you know, you know, nine out of 10 people that, that you walk by on the street or that you see going to and from work every day, stuff like that. Um, so kind of the neighborhood's kind of the smallest unit of, of human, or I'm sorry, scratch that, the largest unit of, of human congregation that someone can kind of mentally grasp. Like once you get up to the, even the size of a city of even say like 10,000 or so, where you have at least two or three neighborhoods, um, you're probably not going to know absolutely everybody. You're, there's probably going to be large chunks of people coming in and out all the time that, that you just, you can't keep everyone straight. You can't possibly know everybody. So uh, assuming that people kind of stay w- relatively where they're at after uh, some sort of big upheaval, then I think kind of trying to work towards that neighborhood level, that's, that's, a, that's a good goal to start if you're wanting to start to think more uh, in a mutual aid or, or a you know, collectivist sort of uh, um, mind frame. So we'll continue on to the end of the chapter, though. We're almost done with this already. In the matter of clothing, the citizens would adopt the same principle as in the matter of provisions. That is to say, they would offer freely from the common store everything which was to be found in abundance and dole out whatever was limited in quantity. Not being able to offer to each man a sable lined coat and to every woman a velvet gown, society would probably distinguish between the superfluous and the necessary, and, provisionally at least, class sable and velvet among the superfluities of life, ready to let time prove whether what is a luxury today may not become common to all tomorrow. While the necessary clothing would be guaranteed to each inhabitant of the anarchist city, it would be left to private activity to provide for the sick and feeble those things provisionally considered as luxuries and to procure for the less robust such special articles. And again, we do have instances of this uh, to draw from uh, mutual aid disaster relief during the, the aftermath of Katrina did organize these sorts of uh, endeavors to, to get things like fresh water and clothing and shelter for the people whose neighborhoods they were in. They also organized collective self-defense against these roving gangs of, of white supremacists who were literally hunting black people uh, because there was no law enforcement around. Law enforcement couldn't even get into the areas and there was basically nothing stopping them, which is a scary thought that there are you know, significant amounts of people that actually do think that way where the only thing holding them back is fear of retribution. Now, a, a more hopeful note on that is that once mutual aid disaster relief kind of set up this this uh, mutual self-defense, and, and it was just the presence of, of them with guns, uh, not even really, I don't know that there was any actual exchange of fire or, or deaths that, that occurred from it, but just a show of force saying that, hey, we're not going to allow you to predate, to predate these people. Just that alone uh, was enough to, to hold them at bay. So... At the same time, I think these, these sorts of people that literally would hunt other people for sport uh, are also cowards and are opportunists. And once they get any resistance, you know, any sort of uh, collective effort against them, then, you know, they, they just turn tail and, and they don't bother you anymore. So another good reason to start these sort of mutual aid networks ahead of time so that if even if just a, say a disaster happens in your area and, and it's the, the same sort of scale or there's a mass supply line shortage or, or any sort of shock to the system, it's good to have these things organized ahead of time so that, that people have reassurance that people other, other people have their back um, and that they're going to continue to be able to survive. Uh, but also just as... I, I, don't, I don't know what the other part of that thought was, but yeah, just, you know, it's a good idea to put these things together ahead of time 
so that, you know, you're ready for when the time comes, if it ever comes, which, you know, it may never happen in our lifetime that, that anything like this happens. You, you know, capitalism may consume enough resources and just continue on consuming and then eventually taking from the poorest countries first uh, to the point where there's not even, say, like fossil fuels being shipped to the poorest parts of the world and the, the richer countries just start taking it all for themselves. They may be able to, to game this out uh, for generations, maybe even for lifetimes. So, you know, there's, there's no guarantee that, that capitalism will fall apart at any point, uh, even if pushed. So, you know, but it's still a good thing to, to put in place. It's still a good way to behave in the world if we care about these principles. To the daily consumption of ordinary citizens. But, it may be urged, this gray uniformity means the end of everything beautiful in life and art. Certainly not, we reply, and we still base our opinion on what already exists. We propose to show presently how an anarchist society could satisfy the most artistic tastes of its citizens without allowing them to amass the fortunes of millionaires. And that's the end of chapter seven. Uh, yep, yeah, that's, that's clothing for you. All right, so you said you had some thoughts about this that you'd like to show at the end. So rather than me just rambling on some more, why don't, why don't you take it away with what you got? All right, so I tend to like clothing, like fashion, like what's going on. However, I do think it's really interesting that like we currently live in a situation where like fast fashion, like it's fast. It comes in and out of style so quickly. It's poorly made. It falls apart right away. And it's kind of sad, but I think that the idea of like putting things back in the hands of people, people mm. will get the things that they need and they will get better quality in clothing. Oh, like sure. I know recently there's been a big push towards these like capsule wardrobes where you only have 40 pieces in the entire closet. You switch things out per season and store other things away and you don't go clothing shopping unless you need to replace a key item. Um, and it's like a mix and match sort of Yeah, it's a mix right? and match. Like you use a certain color palette and everything's supposed to go with everything else. And it's supposed to help you like reduce the amount of clothing you have and like try to, pardon me, like nip that bad, excuse me, nip the fast fashion in the bud. Hmm. And I think, I mean, I've, I've attempted it, pardon me, and I think it has taken a lot of stress away of just being able to put on clothes and everything goes with everything else and not having to stress about things. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I do think there's something to be said for people wanting their clothing to be artistic and kind of have a little flair and like... Mm -hmm representation of themselves but I mean I think that comes in again where people are like trading like oh you're a woodworker I would love you to redo my banisters I'm a jeweler I can fix your rings hmm. and necklaces you know like that sort of like exchange right right within the community yeah the people like, just helping each other out with the skills and, and the resources that they they happen to have or be able to mm -hmm. or are able to procure yeah mm-hmm but I mean, really, overall, current with our current system, the fashion industry is terrible. the The quality is terrible. The products are terrible. Like things, like sizing is not standard. Like mm -hmm. you can buy four pairs of size twelve jeans, and they are not all the same size. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be really nice to get that, like flushed out for like sizing and mm -hmm. for quality and like another thing I just popped back into my head too is like thinking about like necessity items like you can go thrifting and I highly recommend it it's very fun but if you're on the market for a winter coat even through thrifting you may not find what you need mm -hmm. yeah no, no. That, that definitely is uh a problem a lot of the time. I don't think I've even found that many winter coats at, at thrift stores that, you know, weren't either falling apart or just didn't really fit me. I, I, I'm a bigger guy, so mm -hmm. it, it tends to be harder for those. Uh, my shoes, too. Like, I, I wear size 13 shoes, and uh, 
that it's a it's a rare instance where there's any shoes in a thrift store that are size 13, uh, let alone ones that are for the, whatever purpose I need them for. So I end up, you know, sometimes just having to go with uh, whatever I can find. Like I have some uh, Pumas that I got like a couple years ago. And it's like, you know, they, I mean, they work as, you know, everyday shoes. I just slip them on and whatever. But then they would definitely wouldn't be my first choice. But I think uh, something that, that came to my mind uh, when you were uh, talking about like the fast fashion and stuff like that, and that's the, the global supply lines that we currently rely on. Um, you may have cotton that's produced in, say, North America or Africa and then shipped to a Southeast Asian um, garment factory. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it may even be sent to another place to, to have the, the screen printing done to it. Uh, and then it may be sent all the way back to the U.S. Uh, to finally be put into stores. And along the way, because these, these items tend to be, especially in the fast fashion end of things, they tend to be very flimsy, a lot of it's going to be ripped or broken by the time it finally makes its way back to the store. So there's already uh, waste um, ahead of time before anything even hits the, the, the shelves. But then just thinking about if we're coming to any sort of societal shock and it doesn't have to be, say, a revolution. It, again, it could be just a, a major disaster or uh, a disruption in fuel supply or any number of these, these things that, that we really rely on uh, every day to, to absolutely keep functioning and, and have no disruption. I mean, I just think recently to uh, Corona last, last year at this time when stores were routinely uh, selling out of toilet paper. Just, just from the little shift, and there, there's, there's even evidence that that wasn't necessarily caused by runs on the market, as much as it was caused by people shifting from working in an office, which is a totally different toilet paper supply company, versus the commercial brands. So just, just from being at home more, that little difference in this, this on-demand uh, supply chain that we have totally disrupted the system totally wiped out the the because there was no supply basically there weren't vast warehouses of reserves that they could just draw from if if things changed they, i mean they, they the entire business model is is so finely tuned that they're predicting like what the demand in this day is going to be and what the demand in this time of year is going to be and they only manufacture that much they don't account for things like disasters or pandemics or geopolitical instability that sort of thing so it doesn't take much to really grind major parts of the system to a halt and the same would be true of food the same would be true of clothing the same is true of any of these things that that rely on these global supply chains so i think where we can turn to kind of you know buffer against that to build up some resilience is permaculture and permaculture is not just about growing food Permaculture is about producing all of the necessities of life uh, as much as you can on as small of a space, basically, as you can without having massive inputs that you also are then relying on, like fertilizer supply chains. That's another thing. The supply of, of commercial phosphorus is dwindling because they've just about mined it out and the biggest source was in Africa. And, and they're, they're coming to the end of the global phosphorus, which is a, one of the critical components of uh, agriculture that you know you your NPK and then one of those is phosphorus and without that you're gonna have industrial uh, operations just grinding to a halt because they're, they're kind of strip mining the soil so permaculture on the other hand says let's not worry about these global supply chains let's think as much as we can as locally as we can to get all the things that we need so they do things like they don't till the soil. That's a, that's a common strategy. They plant perennials that you don't need to be using a, a machine planter year after year to make stuff. And that can also apply not just to food, but to uh, what we call fiber. Fiber includes building materials. It includes things for clothing and not just cotton. There's plenty of other materials like hemp, for example, that you can make uh, clothing out of. So I think if we, if we try and weave some of these, these permaculture principles and ideas and techniques into our, our mutual aid organizations, 
that you know hopefully we're, we're building up beforehand then I think we stand a much better chance of, of riding out whatever sort of crash happens and and riding it out well not just providing the basics but living really well so that, that's one reason that, that permaculture first interested me so much is I, I kind of had bought into this this idea of peak oil where you know there's the, the not to go too into the weeds but there's this thing called the Huber curve and basically it says that once you from the, the first point that you tap an oil well I think it's something like 50 years before you get to the peak production where any more effort, any more energy you're putting into it, you're getting less energy back. People don't think about that too much, but it takes energy to extract energy from the ground, whether it's natural gas, whether it's oil, whether it's coal, it takes energy. So it's, there's this point where, you know, you've taken all the easy energy out and you get to the harder and harder ones, you know, the the, the less pure veins of, of, of coal, the, the less uh, pure you know, oil deposits, the, the, the shale gas, you know, the fracking came along and, and kind of changed that whole equation. But anyway, I'm getting way out on a tangent. The point was, though, that permaculture first appealed to me because it seemed like an answer to that, because they too were talking about shocks to the system. They were thinking it was going to be peak oil and then also climate change on top of that. And you know, definitely climate change is still becoming a bigger and bigger issue that you know, just just think. Uh, uh, that that actually reminds me. We we had a power outage about you know a couple weeks ago in the middle of the night. It happened to be a hot night, it, and the air conditioner went off all of a sudden. And it didn't take long for that heat to really start rising, because our our system, our building was set up with with air conditioners built in. You know, but if if you take a permaculture look instead you can you can do things like plan for passive solar instead so you have it so where uh, the sun that shines into the building during the winter because of the lower angle of the sun it, it exposes more of the interior to heat or, or light that, that gets absorbed as heat and then re-radiates re that into your building uh, throughout the night and, and helps kind of stabilize the temperature without you having to put in any extra energy and then in the summertime, because the angle of the sun is, is more extreme, you don't get as much light in. And then also you can do things like plant deciduous trees so they lose their leaves in the summer. You have more light penetration. Or, I mean, sorry, they lose their leaves in the winter, so you have more light penetration. And in the summer, they provide that natural screen. So, so just doing things like that, using these permaculture principles to, to plan our cities uh, for the future, uh, even for, for things like food security, just planting things like fruit trees and stuff like that, I think they can they can really help enhance and, and make more resilient our our mutual aid system. And I've I've been talking a whole long time. I'm sure you got some stuff to say. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry about that. I didn't mean to <laughs> bulldoze you. I just one thought after another. That's alright. Yeah. I know you snowball. Yeah. Sorry, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was also thinking back on the fashion issue, like clothing and whatnot. Like, people with disabilities, people in wheelchairs, people with, like, lymphedema, like, swollen appendages and things like that, like, mm -hmm. getting clothes that are tailored to their bodies. Like, if someone in a wheelchair has a job interview, a regular sport coat runs too long for their body, and the coat will get caught in the spokes of their wheelchair and either wreck the coat, stain the coat, or... You know, catch them at a bad time and they'll go swim. Yeah, yeah right. They'll lose good. control of their chair. Yeah, and possibly get hurt. Yeah, don't so, want that. I mean, they sound like trivial things, but they're important. Or like, I mean, I have to wear compression stockings and they're medical socks, and even though I have insurance and everything else, these socks always cost me well over a hundred dollars a pair, and it's just. It's really difficult because you almost have to have, you really have to stretch out your dollars and it would be really nice to live in a world where it's like, oh, okay, I've worn these too much. They've worn out in the heel or the toe. That's usually the heels for me. And I can just go get another pair and not have to like, okay, I have to squirrel away X amount of money to be able to fix the socks that I need to like sustain my existence. I mean, clothes go so far beyond just like, fashion oh absolutely that's definitely true
but that's something I think about a lot because like having things tailored or fitted or if they're for medical use or like mm-hmm. think about orthotic shoes. Uh-huh. Those are astronomical. Yeah. But people need them. Yeah. And, and like it, it's not always a choice. And at some point these these kind of I don't want to call them specialty things, but these things that are, are less easy to come by mm-hmm. may become even more hard to come by if these these supply lines, for whatever reason, uh, break down. So we have to come up with alternatives. Mm-hmm. And we should start thinking about that now while we have a cushion. Uh, I'm not, and I'm not trying to be doomer about it or anything, just like, I, I think a good way to look at it is think about doing without, but not doing without uh, what's a good way to say that doing doing without excess I suppose doing well with less doing well with less yeah that, that's part of it but then but but not having to sacrifice quality of life I, I guess that's kind mm-hmm. of what I was grasping at but then don't you think in some ways that these things would naturally sort themselves out because yes I may need compression stockings mm-hmm. but you don't need compression stockings sure. and a lot of other people I didn't know don't need compression stockings and like you need special shoes but not everybody in the world needs a size 13 shoe so i think these things kind of will like check and balance themselves out and i was thinking back into the chapter that we were listening to just now Mm -hmm. like the velvet gown i personally have zero need for a velvet gown i mean sure might be fun to borrow one sometime if the need arises but i highly doubt it yeah, I'm not George Costanza. I don't dream of draping myself in velvet, even if it was socially acceptable. So I mean, and people's needs are different. People's jobs are different. Like, you know, you think about, like, doctors and nurses. They probably need orthotic footwear. They probably need mm-hmm. uh, compression socks and scrubs and things like that. But, like, you and I don't need scrubs. Yeah. So they do. Right. Like, it's just important, I think, to allocate things where they need to go. Yeah, yeah. But, and like... It, all of us need a good coat, right. especially in Minnesota. All of us need good boots and gloves and hats and scarves. Right. But, like, we don't need 15 scarves. We need one for you and one for me, ultimately. And, and I think if we're, we're thinking about creating a more localized and a more needs-based economy rather than one that's just based on, on profit uh, for shareholders, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think that's a, a better way of looking at things rather than this being... A hurdle to have to get through. Uh, it's, it's it's an opportunity. It's one more thing that you can connect to neighbors about. Say, hey, you know, what what is something that you can't do without? You might not have any idea that this person depends on on whatever it is. Um, yeah, like you can make a community needs list, and then sure, people could like check idea. the board yeah. and like, oh, okay, you need more socks. Well, I have too many socks right yeah. now, so I'm gonna go see if you want my extra. Right. And that sounds a lot like what Kropotkin was just talking about in this chapter where, you know, these, he said these organizations would spontaneously uh, uh, arise to uh, take inventory and of, of need and of supply, basically. Why not do that ahead of time? Let, let's, let's just work that all out ahead of time so that there's not these sort of scrambles of power when it comes down to, to, to go time where, where people know, uh, have, a, have a reasonable expectation that... that everyone's needs will will at least be inventoried and and, and to the best of all our collective abilities uh, satisfied Mm -hmm. but I mean the more you think about it the more complex it gets like uh, just in terms of like life-saving medication like what are we going to do about insulin if if the supply line breaks down does anyone know how to make you know how to extract insulin from I don't even know how you make it they used to get it from uh some sort of farm animal, I believe. It was pigs. Pigs, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, I think you're right. Because I, I believe that uh, uh, pe- Jewish people that kept kosher would refuse insulin because it came from a pig, and, and pigs are not kosher. So it's something we got to think about again. Where are we going to get things like insulin? People are not going to stop needing insulin just because there's been a revolution or a disaster or some other sort of longer and slower shock to the system. But then again, I think this is another issue of, like, distribution. Distribution. Well, yeah. I mean, well, right now, definitely, especially for those of you unfortunate enough to have to deal with the American healthcare system and all its price gouging, yes, it's it's definitely an issue of distribution and also greed and um, artificial scarcity and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. But 
you know that that's you know maybe that's your jam though maybe maybe the idea of saving people uh, you could you could even start doing it now like again uh, Bill Mollison who was one of the the founders of permaculture had this phrase he'd say all the time and, and most permaculturists will repeat this you know almost ad nauseum but it's it's the problem is the solution so rather than looking at something as saying you know like he, how he would put it is saying you don't have a slug problem in the garden. You have a lack of ducks problem. Ducks eat slugs. They're really good at eating slugs without destroying your, uh, your annual food crops. So by saying, hey, this thing is causing a stress, what naturally takes care of that stress? Uh, or how can we more naturally integrate that stress in, in a way that, that we can mitigate it? Um, without having the same hardships that we, we currently incur, I, I think that's a good way of looking at these sort of supply ideas ahead of time, you know. If someone has a lack or has a, a lack of insulin problem, what can that solution be? How could you and I don't act, I don't know an answer off the top of my head, but I, I'm sure that if we thought about it long enough and enough of us with enough expertise thought about these sorts of things, we could start taking care of this ahead of time. And then even if there never, even if in our lifetimes that shock never came, maybe we could supply insulin to people w without gouging the hell out of them. You know, I, I think at this, I'm almost certain at this point, drugs like insulin are in the public domain or what, whatever. I don't know what the, the term for it is, but the, basically you can't regulate the generic form of it. Right. So, Mm -hmm. If we could find a different way to... The patent's expired. The patent's can... expired, essentially, yeah. So, oh, so that's, an, that's an opportunity right there to, to build community, to do, to do real, actual good for people's needs, and then at the same time, prepare ourselves just in case something bad happens. But again, live well in the process, not have to sacrifice our quality of life. In fact, improve our quality of life if things work out. You had something you want to add there? Oh, I just wanted to say, like... With things like insulin and that, I was just reading an article literally before we sat down to do this. And they were talking about the cost of insulin and the cost of insulin in the United States right now is $95 a vial. But in Canada, Canada, we live in Minnesota. Canada's right there. <laughs> and Canada is charging people $12 a vial of insulin. And like there's other, like $7, $14. Everybody else is like 90 times less expensive than it is here in the United States. And that's just, again, it's that corporate greed. It's yeah. that money, money, money. Like everything in this country is a transaction. Yeah. Even your life is a transaction. And it just blows a big hole in the idea that, oh, the market is the most efficient system for distributing goods and services. But it's not. It's not, because all it takes is one person, you know, someone like a Martin Screlly of the world and they can just throw a wrench in the entire works just to squeeze an extra dollar out of something that's been around for 80 years mm -hmm. that that's not an innovation they, he didn't even do anything when he who we came up with that scheme well look at the distribution of uh covid19 vaccines yeah, that's a good and point and the lag too. there too like yeah, well, this shouldn't the, have to be the, the amount of uh high-ranking officials who have gotten caught distributing uh, doses that were meant for the general public or first line workers or what have you and instead diverting it to friends and family because they happen to be you know at the right place well connected in the right place yeah exactly you know this mm -mm -mm. there's some major flaws in this system major flaws. that we live in and part of that's the, a flaw in thinking that well you know my family I'm an important person my family needs to be there to support me because I'm important, so I deserve this more than you. No, 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 no. That, that, that's, that's BS. Everyone's life is important and, and deserving of mm -hmm. continuing, you know. And like, I mean, period. No qualification needed. People should be able to get the vaccines if they want them. I mean, I've literally heard about places that are just throwing them away at night mm -hmm. because... That's it's they so can't sad. refreeze them, though. Yeah. Like, the Pfizer one, I think, is the one that has to be at the coldest temperature. And they'll pull too many vials. And, mm -hmm. like, it just goes away. And it's like, okay, well, why don't you round up all the homeless people and offer it to the homeless people? Yeah. And, and, and give it to them. Or put out a thing at night. Hey, right. we've got this many doses. Whoever signs up first 
you need to get here in the next hour and, and take And I've off. heard of some programs like that, but still, yeah. there, there ends up being waste because, again, right. capitalism is not the most efficient system. And, mm-hmm. and, and even, uh, even if it was, efficiency is not necessarily the most desirable trait because, well, actually, I'm going to put that aside. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the efficiency versus resilience talk later, but we've already gone uh, <laughs> almost three quarters of an hour. And we, we've just done five minutes so far. So uh, unless you had some more to say about this chapter, I think we should probably move on to the next one. Okay. So I'm, if you do, that's totally that's fine. Right. But uh, I really enjoy our discussion and our back and forth here. But yeah, just up to yeah. you because I know you don't want to stay up super late either. I know. So. I'm really like old. Actually, no. <laughs> I just get up really early and I get... When the sun comes up, I wake up. When the sun goes down, I go down. Yeah. yeah. That's how I operate. And that's totally fine. That's a, that's a natural cycle. Nothing wrong with that. But anyway. All right. Let's continue on. Uh, I'm going to make sure everything's set up ahead of time this time. All right. It looks like we are all synced up correctly. So let's get on to chapter eight. Oh, oh sorry. Did you have something more? Oh, I was just going to This audio production was made okay. in collaboration with... Sorry. Go ahead. What do you want I to mean, say? really, what I've learned from this so far, these first few chapters, is really, like, I think, honestly... Honestly, truly, at the bottom of my heart, that, like, all of the issues that we have right now would be incredibly simple to fix Mm -hmm. if we would just change systems. Yeah. And, I mean, there's always going to be people who make more money. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's fine. They can buy the luxury items, like Mm -hmm. the velvet ball gown and the fur coats. Like, I don't care. I don't need it or want any of those things. And I I would say as long as they're not in doing so seriously damaging the ecosystem to the point Mm -hmm. where it's it's irreparable or at least going to lead to death if or, you know, hoarding so much wealth that they they are amassing power well beyond what any one person should have Mm -hmm. and just kind of lording it over everybody as long as they're not hitting that level of of wealth then yeah i don't really care if you have a slightly nicer house or even a much nicer house as long as there's people that aren't going with no one living on the street right yeah Yeah. as soon as we're taking care of homelessness everyone has a clean safe warm you know reliable place to live and, and we've come up with systems to, then, to all support each other going forward. And make sure all the baseline needs are met for all of the people. Yeah, yeah. Not just housing, but all of them. Yeah. Right. But whatever the category may be, as long as the, the, everyone's needs are met, it doesn't matter as much if, people ha- if some people end up with a little bit more. Um, well, like some people just aren't that flashy. They really don't care. Like, I mean, I don't. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things that I definitely value more sure. than other things. Like, like I plants once, for one. Huh? Like plants for one. Leave my plants out of this. <laughs> oh, now they are plants. Oh, okay. Leave our plants out of this. <laughs> I lost my train of so thought now. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail you there. Yeah, you anyway, let's, let's get into the next chapter, and I'm sure it'll come back to you. Sure it will. I'm sure it will. The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin. Read by Lindsay Thorson. Chapter 8, Ways and Means, Part 1. If a society, a city, or a territory were to guarantee the necessaries of life to its inhabitants, and we shall see how the conception of the necessaries of life can be so extended as to include luxuries, it would be compelled to take possession of what is absolutely needed for production, that is to say, land, machinery, factories, means of transport, etc., Capital in the hands of private owners would be expropriated and returned to the community. The great harm done by bourgeois society, as we have already mentioned, is not only that capitalists seize a large share of the profits of each industrial and commercial enterprise, thus enabling them to live without working, but that all production has taken a wrong direction, as it is not carried on with a view to securing well-being to all. For this reason, we condemn it. Moreover, it is impossible to carry on mercantile production in everybody's interest. To wish it would be to expect the capitalist to go beyond his province and to fulfill duties that he cannot fulfill without ceasing to be what he is, a private manufacturer seeking his own enrichment. Capitalist organization, based on the personal interest of each individual trader, has given all that could be expected of it to society. It has increased the productive force of work. The capitalist, profiting by the revolution affected in industry by steam, 
by the sudden development of chemistry and machinery, and by other inventions of our century, has endeavored in his own interest to increase the yield of work, and in a great measure he has succeeded. But to attribute other duties to him would be unreasonable. For example, to expect that he should use the superior yield of work in the interests of society as a whole would be to ask philanthropy and charity of him, and capitalist enterprise cannot be based on charity. It now remains for society to extend this greater productivity. Before we lose that point, I think that's really important little nugget to pull out there. Capitalist society cannot rely on, on charity, or it cannot be organized around charity. And that's not just something that he's saying. That's legally true for most corporations. They have what's known as a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, meaning that their responsibility is to return as much profit as possible to the people that have invested in their company. Um, so it's not just a turn of phrase. It's not just saying that these people are, in their nature, greedy. It's that the system is set up in order to maximize profit and nothing else, you know. So even if you have a company that wants to do good, it can't necessarily. It may be legally constrained. And now there's these some new organization types like a B Corp, you know, a benefit corp that can be for the greater good. But I don't, I don't have much faith in that happening because, for one because capitalism is so much based on competition, if you are diverting some of your profit, even if for the best of intentions, you may have competitors that take advantage of that and undercut you. Um, the same is, is true of uh, regulation. And that's one, one reason that regulations under capitalism are so vital is because if you are a good person and you don't feel like dumping your, say, your coal tailings, your coal waste into the local river because you don't want to poison all the, the towns downstream. Well, then you have to, you got to figure out what to do with all that coal waste. And it's probably going to cost you money to dispose of it in other means. Uh, all it takes then is a competitor who is willing to do that, who doesn't care about the future or the people that aren't directly working for him, or maybe even not the people that are working for him because he can just get a rotation of labor coming in at all times as <laughs> his workers are poisoned or crushed or, you know, worn out, so to speak. All it takes is, a, is one or two competitors, and if all you're competing on is price, then that's it. You end up losing your business because you're trying to take a stand. Capitalism is set up not for the most good for the most people. It is for the most profit for the very few, the ones that are lucky enough to be able to own stock in, in a successful company, basically, as well as the, the CEOs and the you know, board of directors, so, so on and so forth, the, the higher ups, basically. So just an important point to, to keep in mind going forward because he, he keeps on trying to hammer on this point that you can't just keep on doing the same economic system after the revolution and just have it be a kinder gentler version there are no half measures eventually it would go back to people doing making decisions business decisions based on the bottom line rather than other people and at this point the only counter to that is basically re uh, regulation you know, some, some bit of marketing too. Like you can say, oh, we're, we're recycling X number of our bottles that we produce or whatever. But, you know, you look at the fine print usually and you find it's not even nearly as rosy as a company like that is saying. And it's more or less just greenwashing or window dressing or, or that sort of thing. So capitalism is pushing us towards a cliff, you know, ecologically, socially, in every regard. Uh, and it's, it's all in the name of diverting as much to the upper echelon as humanly possible so that they always come, up, come out on top, basically. Another interesting thing I'd like to add to that, back on the like, idea of medication. So like, what I think is really fascinating is the difference between a brand name drug and a generic is literally the binding ingredients. By law your active ingredients have to be the same between 
your generic and the brand name drug. So, like, what's the point of gouging? I mean, the only reason anyone ever needs a difference is because they're, like, allergic to a binding agent. Pretty pretty much, yeah. And why should you gouge someone because they have an allergy to a binder? Sorry. Don't use a fish emulsion. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Pick something different. Right. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely not reflected in the, the cost difference. It's not like it would cost... You know, ten times more to to use a different binding ingredient. Right. I mean, it's obvi- usually obviously, not if the that... generics can do it cheaper, then there's a cheaper way of doing right. it. Right. <laughs> I mean, so. like you as a customer often are like, "Give me the generic, whatever's the cheapest." Yeah. Well, because you're forced to. <laughs> yeah. Because you've only been given, you know, the the very basics to continue uh, reproducing your labor, basically. Right. So, yeah. Very good point. which is limited to certain industries, and to apply it to the general good. But it is evident that to guarantee well-being to all, society must take back possession of all means of production. Economists, as is their want, will not fail to remind us of the comparative well-being of a certain category of young, robust workmen, skilled in certain special branches of industry. It is always this minority that is pointed out to us with pride. But is this well-being, which is the exclusive right of a few, secure? Tomorrow, maybe, negligence, improvidence, or the greed of their employers will deprive these privileged men of their work, and they will pay for the period of comfort they have enjoyed with months and years of poverty or destitution. Go ahead. What you got? Exploiting the workers. Yeah. Excellent. So, when I think about, like, in different sorts of situations in the world, mm-hmm. I find that it's really, it happens a lot where an employee is like, gonna let people go because it's like well I can get people to do the same job and pay them half of what I pay you right. why would I keep you which is such an unfortunate thing when you have workers who are like really passionate about what they're doing or like passionate about the message of this company or these people in this business and they're just willing to let you go because you're expendable yeah I, I would almost put it as, as though it's like uh it's not a reverse Ponzi scheme, but it's like a Ponzi scheme uh, put into effect against the workers. So as long as you have new workers coming in the door, you can keep on affording to you can keep affording to let them go again and again and again. This is basically the model of virtually any gig economy job that you can look at out there, whether it's Instacart, whether it's Uber. I worked Lyft and Uber for three years. I love the job itself. I love getting to uh, meet people and, and, and see all parts of the, the metro area I never got to see. But at the same time, it put a ton of wear in my car. I, I think over those three years, um, I even switched cars and the car that I, I had last, uh, I put about 200,000 miles on it. Almost 300,000. Yeah. Were get, you were over 250. I was getting pretty, I was, it was getting far up there anyway. But the point is, and you know, when you, when you, when you look at, uh, when, if you were to look at, at my tax return, I was working full time, uh, even, even mostly six days a week. And the only way that I was really making a profit was through, uh, the tax breaks, the mileage tax breaks that, you know, luckily I, I kept very good track of each mile that I, I spent and was able to deduct that. But other than that, you know, so I had someone help me with my taxes and was like, how do you even make a profit doing this? And like, oh, well, I don't know. Like I get, I get a check each week, but you know, when you look at it, it basically was extracting value from my car and putting it into my pocket and nothing more. And Groups like Uber and Lyft, they, they really take advantage of this sort of thing by making it super easy for anyone to get a job. All you got to do is have a clean driving record and a car that, that meets, you know, very, you know, I mean, you, you should see the, 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 they call them TNC inspections that you have to put your car through. Very easy to pass uh, inspections. And, and you can be on the road and you can set your own hours, you can, you know, make your own time and that's all well and good. But... You don't have any protection. Um, they don't care at all. Like uh, someone, no fault of my own, someone sideswiped me while I was on the highway. I had passengers in the car. Uh, no one was hurt, you know, but it put my car out of commission for, it was like a month, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, his insurance paid for it to be fixed. So did Uber 
pay me for that time? Absolutely not. Even though you were a full time employee, Even though I was, I was like technically you're... full time, but because they, they, yeah. they, you know the, the the legal jargon that they used to make it so that I was a contractor rather than an actual employee, mm-hmm. uh, they didn't have to care about me at all. They didn't have to pay me any sort of compensation. I was taking all the risk for that job, um, and that that's that's how these these gig uh, economy jobs all are. They, they, they're all some version of that. You take all the risk, and you know, they take most of the reward just for having an app. Like basically, they're they're getting paid just to to have an app that's no more complex, probably than say like Angry Birds or something like that. So, and another thing with that too, just like the expendable employees, right? Like you're super easily repay, replaced by someone I can pay right half of what you're paid. Is the cost then of onboarding a new pl- new employee? Mm-hmm. And I was looking. Again, I'm really terrible at keeping track of my sources. I need to work on this. Yeah, no problem. But the cost of onboarding a new employee is $1,500. Every time you have a, an employee leave, to replace them is $1,500 at least. That's just to get them onboarded, right? Mm-hmm. Not paid and whatever. Right. So. Right. But that, I mean, that's only if you have, say, a marketing department that needs to come up with, you know advertisements mm-hmm. for, for, you know, calls for resumes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you have a hiring process, you know. If you streamline sure. everything, like, like you see the least regulated companies, they, mm-hmm. they, they care the, la- the least if there's turnover, you know. They, they, they could care less. Right. Because you were just another, you were a human resource, which mm-hmm. is a really good turn of phrase there because you're, you're, you're kind of human, but you're also just more a resource. You, you are just you're just a gear in the machine. Yeah, yeah living uh, robot that can uh, generate money for them without them having to do much of anything. It's always what I dreamt of being. Yeah, <laughs> who hasn't dreamt of being a cog in the machine? Sure. <laughs> I meant a robot. Oh, a robot. Okay, well, a robot too. Yeah, yeah I want to be a robot. Robot would be pretty cool. Sure. Someone need health insurance. Let's, let's move on. I'm not even sure what the point we were grounding that in is okay. at this point, but that's okay. We're having fun. So, oh, and if you have any questions in in the chat, there, feel free to ask them. Uh, this is this is an educational space. It's here to help people learn. We're never never gonna make fun of you unless you're some right wing chud who uh, uh, is gonna cause problems. <laughs> but then we're still gonna Just, talk to you. Like we'll still talk to you. We'll still give you a chance. But. Uh, uh, but yeah, so if for, for anyone in chat, uh, all questions are welcome. There's no, no dumb questions. It's okay if you never read this. It's okay if you don't really know what you think about any of this yet. Um, that's fine. We all start at that place at some point. And, and I'm here to, to help guide people into just learning a little bit more. You know, I'm helping you trying to get that next mile down the road on your journey to uh, having a good grounding in actual leftist theory. Because I, I feel that it's... Uh, you know, for myself, it's, it's something that I wish I had come to, say, when I was in high school. But uh, because of, you know, and I went to a fairly liberal high school. Um, but just because the, there's so much stigma, you know, and especially back then, so much stigma against any sort of left-wing ideology, it was never really taken seriously, you know. So basically, uh, it was never con- I never considered it as a viable option until... You know, a series of things like Occupy and, uh, and then Bernie Sanders and uh, AOC and, and, and so on and so forth until these ideas started coming to the, the fore and some of the stigma went away. I still really never thought of them, even when I consider myself just an anarchist as, as you know, someone who wants to have power spread out as among, among as many hands as possible because that's the best safeguard against anyone abusing that power, even then, I, I still thought of uh, actual people that call themselves anarchists as, as, you know, just very purist, very, uh, you know, dogmatic and inflexible in their beliefs and stuff like that. And I didn't really have a good grasp of what anarchy meant at all. And it's not that I've really necessarily changed my views all that much it's just i've been able to help articulate them through the reading of of theory and i've only read a handful now i've probably read oh maybe a little over a dozen books that are specifically 
leftist theory of any kind. But I feel like I have a much better grasp of, uh, and I'm much better able to articulate what I think about leftist politics. And um, I think that's been really good for me. It's really put me in a good position, or set me in a good direction, I should say, to um, more productive thought and interactions with other people. So, so yeah, that's that's really why I think that's really what I think the power of these these you know you might look at them as moldy old books like this one's, I think coming up on 150 years old, uh, not too far, not in the, in the not too distant future. So. You know, it's it's easy to write it off as out of touch, or that we have completely different circumstances. And in many ways, we do. But I I still think it has a lot to teach us and a lot to to help us with in articulating our ideas. And, and even if you end up disagreeing with it, at least you know why you disagree with it at this point. Um, a lot better than you would having never read the text at all. So that that's kind of my my basis for doing this whole channel is just kind of help people along. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things everyone says they want to read theory, but f few people actually read more than maybe maybe a book. Maybe there's one book that they, they have picked up and is really uh, fired them up and they just kind of stick with that. And they're like, you know, that's enough. I don't want to I don't want to go through anymore or it just seems too too vast or too daunting or too old and esoteric, whatever the case may be. Um, I think it's good to just kind of cut through all that and. Uh, I think it's scary because people don't have people to talk. That's like, another thing, too. Reading... I want to be someone to, that, that people can talk to about this sort of thing and ask questions. And mm -hmm. stuff. Well, that's what I was... I'm oh, I'm to... sorry. I didn't, mean to... <laughs> I didn't mean to totally... Uh... <laughs> take, so what I was about to say... Go ahead. Was... Pretend I didn't say anything. Go ahead. I don't know. It's pretty hard now. <laughs> Just that, like, reading theory, I think, is daunting because you don't necessarily know if anyone else is reading it at the same time as you and like you want to talk about it it's kind of like going to a movie yeah like you i don't really like going to movies by myself because like i want to reflect upon the experience when it's sure. over yeah, it's a social like, thing yeah it's a social interaction even though you're quiet initially sure you know it's like while reading in school it's a lot easier because you have a whole classroom full of people to bounce ideas off of and yeah and that's kind of what i want to make this channel into is, is is that classroom that you never had in high school basically mm -hmm. or college even for that matter I never picked up a, a piece of leftist literature all throughout college you know despite what Caitlin Bennett would uh, have you believe about the, the colleges of America it's it's hardly the the leftist paradise that any of the reactionaries make it out to be and you know there's probably varying degrees of that there's probably m but like even richard wolf who is is um a professor of economics went through all the ivy you know many of the ivy league schools i guess not all of them but he went to i think he went to harvard i think he went to princeton um but those those types of schools anyway never had was exposed to any of that sort of thing through his college he had to learn that all on his own as well so um yeah this is this that's what this is supposed to be like a, a classroom that you know uh capitalist society is never going to touch really because it, it goes against their own self-interest of self-preservation you know i'm not doing this to help you be a better employee uh, i mean in a certain way i am to be a, a better worker to your fellow workers but but definitely not in the, in the eyes of, of whatever management or boss that you have. Not, not doing it to help you be a better cog in that machine, helping you to instead think outside um, the designated walls of, of acceptable discourse, at least in America. Things are different in other countries, I'm sure, but, but in America, these things just aren't even broached at all. Like it's, it's, it's still considered a dirty word, socialist, communist, anarchist, you know, the, these things are taboo so I'm trying to break that taboo and show that it's it's nothing to be afraid of and in fact it can help you in your daily life so anyway I, I feel like I'm talking in circles and rambling so I'm just going to continue on here um, got to make sure it's still hooked up right and we will continue on with chapter eight how many important industries woven goods iron sugar etc without mentioning short-lived trades have we not seen decline or come to a standstill alternately on account of speculations or in consequence of natural displacement of work, and lastly, from the effects of competition due to capitalists themselves. 
If the chief weaving and mechanical industries had to pass through such a crisis as they have passed through in 1886, we hardly need mention the small trades, all of which come periodically to a standstill. What, too, shall we say to the price which is paid for the relative well-being of certain categories of workmen? Unfortunately, it is paid for by the ruin of agriculture, the shameless exploitation of peasants, the misery of the masses. In comparison with the feeble minority of workers who enjoy a certain comfort, how many millions of human beings live from hand to mouth without a secure wage, ready to go wherever they are wanted? How many peasants work 14 hours a day for a poor pittance? Capital depopulates the country, exploits the colony. Yes. How many people in the United States right now do you think actually work more than one job? Oh. Just to mean, like, make their ends make meet. Ends, yeah. Like, not even people with the savings or anything. And I mean, I'm sure there's also plenty of people who have lots of money and they work two jobs because they just want to amass wealth and become a dragon. So, <laughs> I, would, I would say percentage-wise, not plenty, but but yeah, some. Well, okay, enough, okay, uh -huh. right? But, like, if you think about, like, people working part-time job, or not part-time. Or several part-time like, jobs. Yeah, like... You know, especially especially at the, the, the minimum wage end of things. Often mm -hmm. that's the kind of work that is right. on offer. And just imagine, like, puzzle, trying to puzzle piece your schedule together yeah. with, like... Okay, I work this job these days at this time, and I work that job these days at this time, and I have to pick up the kids, and you have to work with your partner who probably also works two jobs, and maybe you guys work the same job, but you work different right. shifts because one of you needs the car, and it's just a nightmare, and you're, like, working so hard, you're busting yourself down, and you're working, like... You know, mm -hmm. seven to three, and then you're working three to eleven, and yeah. the only time you're home, you're asleep, yeah. and your kids are home alone, and or just eating some fast food that you can on the way home. And, right, like uh, oh, mom gets home at eight o'clock. Maybe I'll get some chicken nuggets. She'll bring home yeah. dinner, or dad will bring home whatever. Yeah, I, and from I, work, like that's criminal. Like no one should have to live like that. Absolutely not. People should be able to have enough money working forty hours a week to sustain themselves. And again, it doesn't have to be an opulent lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now you and I live in an apartment and I'm mm -hmm. definitely cool continuing to live in an apartment. This yeah. is a decent apartment. We have enough but space for ourselves. with like health insurance and all these other expenses, like, pardon me, it doesn't leave much left over. Yeah. Even though we I'm both right. work full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. So. Right. And neither of us work anywhere near minimum wage. So it's hard to imagine, you know, I mean... Just, just thinking for myself, you'd have to string together three full-time minimum wage jobs just about to, to make what I make every year. And, and I'm just barely, I mean, like, I don't, I don't have savings. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't go on cruises every year. I, I don't have an excess of, of cash for myself. I couldn't imagine having to work, you know, 60 hours, 72 hours, um, and, and trying to, like you say, piece that all together with, with shifting schedules, especially in the food industry. You yeah, know, and you, you, you don't, you don't tend to have... retail food service, you yeah. don't get a set schedule. Right, it tends to you, kind of rotate around. You get so that, what you get, right. or you get nothing at all. Like, right. Um, yeah, it, it's it's hard for me to even really imagine how, how people who are unfortunately in that position manage to do it, because... I don't know how I could and, and still mm -hmm. maintain my sanity, maintain my health. And I think this is, I'd say this is more than a hunch that it's, it's a part of a strategy that these businesses use. They, they keep you working all the time. They keep you, you know, they let you know that you're just on that knife's edge of getting fired if you don't meet these certain goals and, and, and work these certain hours. And I don't care what your other job says. You work for me when I say you do. Right. You know, stuff like that. This is all part of their strategy. And then also to give you so little free time that you don't have time to talk to, to coworkers and be like, yeah, yeah, are you going through what I'm going through? Yeah, yeah, you know, my, my shift was terrible. I, I had to pee in a bottle because I, because you know, I'm an Amazon worker or, or whatever. Um, and by the way, Amazon is not the only company that, that stretches people so thin that they have to pee in bottles, but uh, not going to get into that. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, that's part of the strategy to, to keep you just on that edge of survival so that you don't have time to even look for anything better, uh, let alone organize 
to to make what you have better and they're depending on you going to a new job it yes it may cost them money uh in the short term to hire new people but at the same time it's part of the strategy to keep you going from job to job to job to job so that you're always the new person for that you know six month period or for that probationary period or or whatever what have you you're always just on the edge of 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 making it so that they can always threaten you that that you're going to be gone because otherwise you might get comfortable and if you get comfortable you might think you deserve more and you might talk to other workers who think that they deserve more and that you're getting a raw deal and you know maybe or you might form a union this is actually that's, that's what i'm building to but thank you yeah you might you might form a union or you might you know somehow strike out on your own and you know you know make a a, a worker own cooperative of whatever business that you have i mean that that's kind of you know that takes a lot of of extra time and, and uh, capital unfortunately in the society to to get that sort of thing going but yeah just like even having the basics of a an organization to represent your interests rather than just hoping and and being grateful for all the scraps that the company gives you oh they gave us a pizza party i guess they're not so bad after all yeah <laughs> exactly you know they 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 uh let me take an extra 20 minute break oh my goodness wow yeah oh oh the, the things are slow so i get to go home early whoa and of course you know you end up and then making, you lose money you lose you money home so. early so but what can you do because you know it's, it's the you know i've worked in food service as well i, I know how that goes and and the thing is, at, at, at the time when you're like, oh, shoot, I get to go home early. I have a whole afternoon ahead of, us, ahead of me that I can do whatever I want. Like, that, that seems like, you know, breathing room. But you get less for it. It's not, you're not being paid to go home early. Or you just get to take But you've a been nap. worked so hard that any sort of pressure, even if it's at the expense of, of money that you need to live on, seems like room to breathe finally. And yeah, that that like you like you say that's that's criminal. That's that's an utterly abhorrent way to treat other mm-hmm. people, people that you depend on as owners to do all the work that makes you all of your money. Right, the, the work that you don't want to do, nor do you probably have any clue how to do efficiently, as compared to your employees or your managers who are in. What's going on? Sorry, I'm just moving out. I feel like it's like right under my chin, so I'm just gonna move the icon around. There we go. Now, now I have some room to breathe on the screen. Sorry, I'm totally, Sorry. totally different. I didn't mean to. Go Sorry. ahead. I, don't, I actually don't remember anymore. It's gone. Okay. Well, I'm sure we'll pick it back up as we continue the chapter here. Let me just make sure we're still hooked in, and we'll be good to go once more. Our industries are but little developed. Dooms the immense majority of workmen to remain without technical education to remain mediocre, even in their own trade. This is not merely accidental, it is a necessity of the capitalist system. In order to remunerate certain classes of workmen, peasants must become the beasts of burden of society. The country must be deserted for the town. Small trades must agglomerate in the foul suburbs of large cities and manufacture a thousand things of little value for next to nothing, so as to bring the goods of the greater industries within reach of buyers with small salaries. That bad cloth may sell, Garments are made for ill-paid workers by tailors who are satisfied with a starvation wage. Eastern lands in a backward state are exploited by the West in order that, under the capitalist system, workers in a few privileged industries may obtain certain limited comforts of life. The evil of the present system is therefore not that the surplus value of production goes to the capitalist, as Robertus and Marx said, thus narrowing the socialist conception and the general view of the capitalist system. The surplus value itself is but a consequence of deeper causes. The evil lies in the possibility of a surplus value existing, instead of a simple surplus not consumed by each generation. For, that a surplus value should exist, means that men, women, and children are compelled by hunger to sell their labor for a small part of what this labor produces, and, above all, of what their labor is capable of producing. But this... So so, so, so there you have it. Capitalism, kind of in the way it's set up, is necessarily exploitative. He's saying that the idea that there even is a surplus, so so money that is is above and beyond what's being compensated to the workers, 
that's just being siphoned to the, the, the top of the company. The fact that there's that surplus at all, it, it's, it's like what we were just talking about. It, it puts the worker in a bad position because they, that surplus comes from the bottom, so they have less. They always have to worry about having less. They always have to worry about being on that knife's edge of, of uh, well, in his day, starvation. We, we've thankfully gone beyond that due, in, in, in spite of uh, capitalism's wishes. Uh, due to regulations forced by labor unions and and political organization, um, but regardless, you, you you still have workers that are just on that edge of of making it all the time because their value is being siphoned upward. Uh, so the idea that there's surplus value at all that's the crime, not just that it goes to the top, but that the, their people are not being compensated in the first place for the labor or the products of the labor that they are doing you know they're not being compensated in relation to the amount of of labor that they are doing the amount of value that they're adding to uh whatever they are producing so that you know it's it's i i think that's really uh just a slight uh slightly different way of looking at it from marx saying you know marx was uh talking about how the surplus labor the crime is that it goes to the top Kropotkin just kind of refining that, just to, just by a little degree, saying, no, the, the real crime happens, that there's surplus at all, that people are not getting compensated in the first place. So, do you have anything else you want to say about that part, or you just want to keep chugging? Yeah. Keep going. Definitely. As long as the instruments of production belong to a few, as long as men are compelled to pay tribute to property holders for the right of cultivating land or putting machinery into action and the property holder is free to produce what bids fair to bring him in the greatest profits rather than the greatest amount of useful commodities, well-being can only be temporarily guaranteed to a very few and is only to be bought by the poverty of a section of society. It is not sufficient to distribute the profits realized by a trade in equal parts. If, at the same time, thousands of other workers are exploited, it is a case of producing the greatest amount of goods necessary to the well-being of all with the least possible waste of human energy. This cannot be the aim of a private owner, and this is why society as a whole, taking this view of production as its ideal, will be compelled to expropriate all that enhances well-being while producing wealth. It will have to take possession of land, factories, mines, means of communication, etc. And besides, it will have to study what products will promote general well-being, as well as the ways and means of production. Part 2 how many hours a day will man have to work to produce nourishing food, a comfortable home, and necessary clothing for his family? Before we get into this, this is a really interesting part. Uh, I want you to pay close attention to this because he's, he's trying to calculate the, the minimum amount of effort that, that a person needs to labor a day on average to produce all the goods uh, necessary for the year. And think about that when you think about the idea that there is a 40-hour work week. Uh, isn't it kind of strange that no matter what job you do, uh, it all fits into a 40-hour work week for the most part? Uh, it doesn't matter if you, you're, you're doing customer service, doesn't matter if you are you know, manufacturing actual goods. 40 hours, that's, that's the standard. It's kind of weird, huh? That, how, how do they calculate that you know, as, as the necessary amount of work for every job? Why is there not a job where full-time is considered 20 hours or 33 hours or whatever. So. In other countries, there is. Well, okay. Well, I'm just talking about America at this point. Okay. Because that, that's how I, I mean, we're lived broken. in... Yeah. <laughs> well, no, we're not broken. This is exactly how capitalism is meant to function. But capitalism breaks people. It, that, that's a much better way to, to put it. Capitalism is not broken. It breaks people. Right? There's a quote of the, the episode right there. I'm so question sorry. has often preoccupied socialists, and they generally came to the conclusion that four or five hours a day would suffice, on condition, be it well understood, that all men work. At the end of last century, Benjamin Franklin fixed the limit at five hours, and if the need of comfort is greater now, the power of production has augmented too, and far more rapidly. In speaking of agriculture and further on, we shall see what the earth can be made to yield to man when he cultivates it scientifically, instead of throwing seed haphazard in a badly plowed soil, as he mostly does today. In the great farms of Western America, some of which cover 30 square miles, but have a poorer soil than the manured soil of civilized countries, only 10 to 15 English bushels per English acre are obtained, 
that is to say, half the yield of European farms or of American farms in eastern states. And nevertheless, thanks to machines which enable two men to plow four English acres a day, 100 men can produce in a year all that is necessary to deliver the bread of 10,000 people at their homes during a whole year. Thus, it would suffice for a man to work under the same conditions for 30 hours, say six half days of five hours each, to have bread for a whole year, and to work 30 half days to guarantee the same to a family of five people. And today, when we start incorporating these ideas of permaculture, the way permaculture is usually, or is, is, is um, the way the principles tell you to organize things is to do a lot of work up front, planting trees, getting, you know, they call them guilds. These are plants that, that interact well together where you might have, you know, harvests that are come in succession. So you're not having all of your corn that you need to harvest all at once. And that's your entire field. And it's way more than one person can do. And you have to hire labor. Instead, you have only enough corn that your family or your your group of, of workers can handle and then you have another crop maybe it's rice and it, it comes in the harvest at a different time and then maybe you have a crop of acorns and you harvest that at a different time and it's never more at a given time you're always harvesting and then at the same time because you're using things like perennial crops and self-seeding crops once you set that stuff up it becomes less and less work to maintain and, and the goal is for it to be a self sustaining, self-perpetuating system much more closely to the way uh, the dynamic equilibriums of an ecosystem work. So things just kind of keep each other in check. There's never, and, and, and that works well with pest control as well. You spend less time on pest control because instead of having, you know, imagine you're a, a corn pest and you come to a field of corn. Well, that's food as, as far as the eye can see and nothing stopping you from, you know, reproducing and then you're, family just exponentially getting to all those corns instead if you're a corn pest and you come to a clump of corn well maybe that's it for that corn this year maybe you can still save it um but you're not going to wipe out the entire thing so you spend less on pest control things tend to keep each other in check and then you're also providing habitat at the same time for uh you know, insect workers to do that, that work for you. There's predatory, predatory bugs that will eat other bugs that, that are pests to you, things like that. So with these permaculture principles, I think, I would wager, that we can get that time for food production and production of a lot of things down even further because you are setting things up at the, at the onset and then, you know, progressively having less and less work to do to have the same sort of yield and at the same time your yields are going up as, as plants are maturing, um, as systems are coming into their own, as you're figuring out what works best for your particular microclimate or whatever. Um, and then we can even take that into the cities and start doing food production in all the unused spaces right now to the point where, you know, you have fruit trees on, on, on the boulevard where people just harvest them as they go by. Hey, instead of having to go out to an orchard and having workers, you know, making it their job to do it, you have a little bit of extra food and then a little bit extra food from here from a berry bush that's that's off on the on the side of the the sidewalk or whatever. You know, we start to transform these lawns into productive land, uh, self-maintaining land. We we choose we select species that are low maintenance that um have other benefits too, like maybe the timber production or medicine or whatever. Um, so I think with with food with permaculture principles, we can get that that amount of production needed, at least in the food and like the fiber and and, and fuel part, way down. So just a little aside there, but let's continue on. Proved by results obtained nowadays. That oh, if sorry, we had recourse to, to intensive too? agriculture, oh. less than six half days work could procure bread, meat, vegetables, and even luxurious fruit for a whole family. And again, if we study the cost of workmen's dwellings built in large towns today, we can ascertain that to obtain in a large English city a detached little house, as they are built for workmen, from 1400 to 1800 half days work of five hours would be sufficient. As a house of that kind lasts 50 years at least, it follows that 28 to 36 half days work a year could provide well-furnished 
healthy quarters with all necessary comfort for a family. Whereas when hiring the same apartment from an employer, a workman pays 75 to 100 days work per year. Mark that these figures represent the maximum of what a house costs in England today, being given the defective organization of our societies. In Belgium, workman cities have Sorry, been... Sorry, what? No, I was just smiling at you. Oh, I thought it was maybe because you mentioned England and you love nope. England so much. You're just smiling. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had some point I was going to make, though. Uh, I know you did. <laughs> oh, did you? You, you, you? you can time it now out when I'm going to yeah. have something i, I got to say about it. About every two minutes. Oh, it's about every two minutes. Well, you know, it keeps, it keeps a nice uh, rhythm going, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but now, of course, I've totally lost whatever it was I was going to say about Sorry. that. <laughs> Sorry, you've been doing that to me all night. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I, I, I got it now. Um, so this is one of those cases where, of course, these numbers are not going to line up today, but but we can still recalculate these, you know, the basic truth that there is an, an amount of work that needs to be done. Um, and even taking into things like uh, maybe we're not going to have as much mechanical production, especially if we really embrace permaculture. That one of the one of the downsides, if if you even want to call it a downside to permaculture, is it's really hard to do with mechanical production because instead of having entire fields that you can just put into corn or soy or whatever and just have you know a planter for corn and then a a, a till or well, you start with tilling a tiller for corn you know a manure spreader for corn a a seeder for corn all these different uh, appliance um, apparatuses for corn and have it just be like so massive that it's you know more work than any human could do on their own um you're gonna have just like i said a clump a clump of corn and then a clump of of you know different trees that have to be harvested in a different way but again because you're being smart about it and you're never um you're, you're never putting in more than you think you can handle with whatever labor you have on hand at any given time of the year, uh, you set things up where you don't actually need as much mechanical work. You might at the beginning, especially if you're doing big earthworks, like there's this concept called uh, the the ditch and berm or the swale and berm on contour system, where if you've ever seen a, a geographical map before and it has all those lines and that shows the different elevations, you know, each line represents a, a 10 foot drop or whatever. So imagine each of those lines, you dig a ditch and then you put the, the stuff that you dig right next to it. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's on the uphill side or the downhill side, but you're, you're making it a ditch and then you're making a, 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 a berm, you know, a, a, a mound of earth. And it's all running along that contour line. So, so if you're imagining then water flowing onto that hill, it's being then collected in the ditch and it's being sunk down into the, that ditch, you know, assuming you're not getting such a huge flooding event that it washes you out. But using that sort of system, you know, you can do all kinds of things. It, it, it puts in all kinds of microclimates. Um, it, it allows you to water less because the, the water is captured and sunk. There's, there's catch and store energy. That's one of the principles of permaculture. So you're catching that water and instead of allowing the gravity to just pull it all the way down the hill and and be gone out of the system you're sinking it below the earth so it slowly comes out and you, you can get to the point if you have enough enough of these ditches and and berms where you can have springs coming out down further into the the lower lands uh so, which is good then for times of drought so it, it really evens the water cycle out but if you're doing a system like that the, the point that i was trying to make is that takes a lot of energy. You're probably not going to do that sort of a thing by hand, especially if you're, do, you're having any, any height to your, your um, berm at all or any depth to your swale. You're probably going to use machines. But then that's a one-time thing. And once that's set, uh, it's, it's less effort that you need to do to maintain that. Assuming that you've made your calculations right and you don't get more rain than you can handle, that sort of thing. But anyway, yeah, I, just, I don't know. What? <laughs> you think it's funny to get off on these tangents, huh? Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, let's continue. 
taking everything into consideration, we are justified in affirming that in a well-organized society, 30 or 40 half days work a year will suffice to guarantee a perfectly comfortable home. There now remains clothing, the exact value of which is almost impossible to fix because the profits realized by a swarm of middlemen cannot be estimated. Let us take cloth, for example, and add up all the deductions made by landowners, sheep owners, wool merchants, and all their intermediate agents, then by railway companies, mill owners, weavers, dealers in ready-made clothes, sellers and commission agents, and you will get an idea of what is paid to a whole swarm of capitalists for each article of clothing. That is why it is perfectly impossible to say how many days work an overcoat that you pay three or four pounds in a large London shop represents. What is certain is that with present machinery, they no doubt manage to manufacture an incredible amount of goods. A few examples will suffice. Today, of course. Thus, in the United States, in 751 cotton mills for spinning and weaving, 175,000 men and women produce 2,033,000,000 yards of cotton goods. Again, Besides the great quantity of thread, not as relevant on the today, average, but we can more than 12,000 yards of cotton goods cotton alone are obtained by a 300 with. days work of 9.5 hours each, say 40 yards of cotton in 10 hours. Admitting that a family needs 200 yards a year at most, this would be equivalent to 50 hours work, say 10 half days of 5 hours each, and we should have thread besides, that is to say, cotton to sew with, and thread to weave cloth with, so as to manufacture woolen stuffs mixed with cotton. As to the results obtained by weaving alone, the official statistics of the United States teach us that in 1870, if workmen worked 13 to 14 hours a day, they made 10,000 yards of white cotton goods in a year. 13 years later, in 1886, they wove 30,000 yards by working only 55 hours a week. Even in printed cotton goods they obtained, weaving and printing included 32,000 yards in 2,670 hours of work a year, say, about 12 yards an hour. The Another important point to pull out of this is that these numbers just keep going up. You know, we have higher and higher yields of food, higher and higher production of, of all these same goods that, that Kropotkin is talking about without any extra labor, in fact, with less labor, uh, more labor is being put onto machines. That's, that's been one of the biggest job killers in the, in the United States. It's not been even outsourcing. More than that, it's been uh, mechanization. Uh, especially in, in areas like coal country, where it takes very few people to even operate an entire coal operation at this point. You just basically, you, you bring the machines in, you, you set them up and they, they do their work. And other than that, you kind of just have a few people to watch it and maybe maintain things once in a while. And that's about all you need. You don't have teams of men blasting and chipping with their pickaxes and, and whatever else would have gone on in the past. And yet... Somehow, people don't have a commiserate, an equivalent increase in their wage. Who does get an increase in their wage? Of, of course, it's the capitalist. It's the owner. Uh, and this is across all industries. It's across all job sectors. You know, things get more and more automated uh, to the point where there's things like legal briefs, where there's been so much legal precedent that's been saved online that... Lawyers don't have to do as much work, you know, familiar, familiarizing themselves and coming up with uh, 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 motions on their own that they can just kind of copy and paste. The same thing is true in my field of, of urban planning, where pretty much any ordinance you look at, you'll find almost the exact same language in the, the neighboring town, whether it's a sign ordinance or, you know, whether it's, it's something like... Uh, you know, if you can build a shed on your property or not, or how far it has to be from the property line. All these ordinances have the exact same language because they just look at each other and they just copy and paste. So it, it takes away even the labor that an urban planner used to have to do because uh, they can just look at what other people have done. They, they assume it's legally sound and they, they go ahead and, and plug it right into what they got. And, and yet again, uh, wages are not going up except for those who own the means basically those are the ones who have had the highest gains especially since the destruction of labor unions since the 70s uh, and it's not a coincidence it's not a coincidence at all that neoliberalism has tracked with wage stagnation for the, the lowest classes pretty perfectly so yep capitalism is is definitely breaking down doesn't mean it can't write itself through another New Deal sort of thing and, and get another few generations out of the, the, the deal. Uh, 
just chugging along. So there's no, there's never a guarantee that thing it will break down completely. Uh, we have to put it upon ourselves to educate ourselves and educate others that there is a better way, a way that we can all win, you know, a way that we can have all for all, as as Kripotkin likes to put it, where the, the wealth of, of generations, the wealth of all of us that we all generate together um, is shared amongst all of us as well, not just the lucky few who happen to win the lottery of birth or be in the right place at the right time to have someone take a chance on them. So, what are your thoughts? Same. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's a tricky one for me. Okay. Like, sure, you, yeah, you want to mull it over more as, as we yeah. go along? Sure. Let's continue on then. 200 yards of white printed cotton goods, 17 hours of work a year would suffice. It is necessary to remark that raw material reaches these factories in about the same state as it comes from the fields, and that the transformations gone through by the piece before it is converted into goods are completed in the course of these 17 hours. But to buy these 200 yards from the tradesmen, a well-paid workman must give at the very least 10 to 15 days work of 10 hours each, say 100 to 150 hours. Find as to the English peasant, he would have to toil for a month or a little more to obtain this luxury. By this example, we already see that by working 50 half days per year in a well-organized society, we could dress better than the lower middle classes today. Think about that too in your own life, in your own work life. Can you afford the goods or the services that your particular company produces? Can you afford it as often as, as the people that are uh, taking advantage of it? Probably not. I know when I was an Uber driver, I couldn't have afforded to take Uber every day, and yet I, I had customers that I would see pretty regularly who did take Uber every day. Interesting that I wasn't being paid enough to even use my own service. So where does that where does that access go? It's got to go somewhere. Probably the same in your case too. You know. So. Well, my work is education, which is free. So. But. I can, <laughs> I can afford free. You can afford free, but I'd say, could you? Uh, yeah, I mean that, that that's something that's being yeah. paid for. It's it's harder in that situation because yeah, the, right. the the state pays for it, but you know, putting it into say a, a private model, could you afford to to send your potential children to a school like yours? Well, that's, that that's school's gonna... free too. No, I'm, I'm saying okay. It's it's yeah. Sorry, okay. I thought we'll, you were we'll trying just, to use we'll my work as a model, but my work is also free. Right, right. So yours is one of those things that we have socialized. It's a free charge. Education school. has been socialized, but but you know there also is a private model of schooling. Oh, of course Could I couldn't was... afford that because it's like okay. thirty thousand dollars a year. That's okay. like my. So you would have to use your entire income to to send your child to that same sort of school, if not for the government paying for it for you. And you know what? To be honest, you guys, though, I don't think that the private school model is any better than the public school model. To be perfectly honest. No. I think the kids get about the same education. They're just better connected in the community for later. That's, That's the thing about all it. all the differences. Yeah, you, you, you rub elbows with the right people. You bump into the right mm -hmm. future contacts. Right. Absolutely. Then you're going to Harvard. Yeah. Yeah, definitely so. With all this, we have only required 60 half days work of five hours each to obtain the fruits of the earth. 40 for housing and 50 for clothing, which only makes half a year's work as the year consists of 300 working days if we deduct holidays. There remains still 150 half days work which could be made use of for other necessaries of life, wine, sugar, coffee, tea, furniture, transport, etc., etc. It is evident that these calculations are only approximate, but they can also be proved in another way. When we take into account how many, in the so-called civilized nations, produce nothing, how many work at harmful trades, doomed to disappear, and lastly, how many are useless middlemen, we see that in each nation the number of real producers could be doubled. And if, instead of every 10 men, 20 were occupied in producing useful commodities, and if society took the trouble to economize human energy, those 20 people would only have to work 5 hours a day without production decreasing and it would suffice to reduce the waste of human energy at the service of wealthy families 
or of those administrations that have one official to every 10 inhabitants, and to utilize those forces to augment the productivity of the nation, to limit work to four or even to three hours on the condition that we should be satisfied with present production. After studying all these facts together, we may arrive then at the following conclusion. Imagine a society comprising a few million inhabitants engaged in an agriculture and a great variety of industries. Paris, for example, with the department of saint -Ewas. Suppose that in this society all children learn to work with their hands as well as with their brains. Admit that all adults, save women, engaged in the education of their children, bind themselves to work five hours a day from the age of 20 or 22 to 45 or 50, and they follow occupations they have chosen in any one branch of human work considered necessary. Such a society could in return guarantee well-being to all its members, that is to say, a more substantial well-being than that enjoyed today by the middle classes. And, moreover, each worker belonging to this society would have at his disposal at least five hours a day which he could devote to science, art, and individual needs which do not come under the category of necessities, but will probably do so later on, when men's productivity will have augmented and those objects will no longer appear luxurious or inaccessible. That's an important point, too. It's hard for people to reach their, their highest and, and best version of themselves and reach their potential and whatever skills they have if they literally have no extra time. So it's important to envision in these sorts of societies uh, more leisure time, you know, that, that people have to pursue these things because they've been given a base to do so. They've been given the basis of survival, but that doesn't mean as much if you don't then also have the opportunity and, and at least the time to pr pursue the things that, that truly interest you. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that, that I do have extra time to pr pursue this, which is now uh, just a hobby, doing this Twitch thing. It'd be awesome if I could someday make it into at least a part-time career, if not full-time. Uh, but, you know, my, my free time being what it is, that's just not really possible at this point. So, But it'd be great if everyone had at least at least the opportunity that I do to at least once a week or twice a week, because I also stream on, on Facebook through uh, the, the two different groups that I have, Left Pod Posting as well as Left Signal Boost. Uh, I was streaming just today a bunch of podcasts about uh, police brutality and, and, and the history of police violence and, and racism that goes right up until today. Um, but I, I'm, I'm lucky to have that time at all. And that's not something that everyone has, especially if you're working a, a lower wage job. Most likely you are working more than one and you have no extra time. So all that potential that we are, are just basically throwing down the, the, the drain because we're not allowing people to have any sort of freedom in their own life. Uh, and it's not just a matter of choice. These jobs still need to be done. Uh, for instance, uh, food workers, if even if every food worker got a better job, someone has to do those jobs, you know, right? Someone has to produce the, the, the food. You look at even worse paid jobs like farm work. Someone still has to do those things. So even if all the farm workers moved on up to a better job, someone's still got to do it. You know, and, and that's really been, been shown in the amount of people that were classified as essential workers during the pandemic, myself included. I could get a better job, uh, but someone's going to come and have to do my job. People need deliveries. People, people need to, logistics is just a part of human society. It will always have to be done, no matter what. So that's the problem with individualizing all these things and saying, well, you could make a better choice. You could move up. You could do. It doesn't matter. The need is still there for that labor, regardless if you're doing it or someone who's less fortunate than you is doing it. Someone's got to do it. So, you know, why then punish them? Why look at them as though they're lesser because they happen to be doing something that's essential but, but maybe doesn't require, a, you know, a, a business degree or, or an advanced degree of some kind. It still is essential. It still is an essential part of the functioning of society. In fact, it's much more essential than a lot of people that are way higher up in any given company that just push paper around or they, they have people to make them look important below them, you know, that don't actually contribute anything. Look up David Graeber's book, Bullshit Jobs, and... 
he has come up with a calculation after surveying uh, people across the country. I think I think he went over to the UK as well and, and surveyed people too. And it's something like forty. I think he said forty percent is the likely amount of jobs of all jobs out there that produce nothing of value to the world. They could go away and it would make no difference in the economy. It would make no difference in, in anyone's material conditions. It would make no difference in anyone's well-being. So just think about that. Like those are definitely not the essential, those are not the essential worker jobs. Those are coming from higher up, you know, by, by definition. They're not essential workers if they're a, a, a bullshit job. So interesting that, that, that we value those people so much less. Uh, collectively as a society. I know probably if you're watching this, you probably value those people a lot more. I, I would at least hope so. Um, I know that I do. And yet, when you look at the, the actual production of what they do, what they do is essential, and what a lot of people that tell them that they're worthless do is not. Not at all. Could go away tomorrow. Wouldn't matter. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? Oh, I was just thinking of like the essential services that are not necessarily glamorous jobs like being a garbage man yeah for or sure. collecting the recycling don't you know those people are amazing those people are amazing. the job is tough in so many facets like every pot it's very physically demanding it smells terrible i'm sure it's long hours you're not in a climate controlled environment but at the same time you get for those garbage men and recycling men out there, I just want to tell you, every time you drive by a daycare, <laughs> well, that's you it, that's, yeah. make their world so exciting. Oh. So next time it sucks to be a garbage man or recycling man or anyone operating a large piece of machinery, just remember, there's someone that doesn't have full control over their body that thinks you are the greatest thing that ever lived. Absolutely, and and and, and, <laughs> and I do too, right? Because <laughs> right, I agree, but I, I I even even I get that same sort of thing. Uh, I, I'm a delivery driver. I drive mm. a big truck. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, and yeah, you should see the kids that just, like, you know, watching me from the window, watching every little thing I do. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. something different's happening. Like, yeah, that, that's a nice. That's probably one of the nicest perks. That and getting to meet dogs, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess, are the nicest <laughs> perks about delivery driving. Um, but anyway, uh, and yeah. I mean, I think in the grand scheme of things that those people should get some sort of additional compensations for having to do a job that is so, uh, especially once they were cla- reclassified as essential. Yeah. Should have mm-hmm. been hazard pay for all of us. I didn't get any of that sort of thing. I got a bagged, uh, a cold yeah, a bag, bag lunch. lunch a couple of times, maybe, maybe for a month. We once a week we get a bag lunch. That was our that was our bonus for for putting our lives on the line to to bring people there. You know, uh, whatever it is that they need. So. And no no vaccination offer either. No, even no. though I had to get it from I, I was from her, from her mother's work. <laughs> That's the only way that I've been able to get my first dose of the vaccine yet. Uh, never even talked to you about the possibility of getting vac- vaccinated, even though you know. I you know. come into contact with hundreds of people every day? Well, I wouldn't, put it, I wouldn't okay. put it that high. But, I mean, you know, uh, I definitely come in contact with enough people that there's definitely a risk. And I'm going into places like businesses. Sometimes people are, are, are older and they need me to bring it into their house or whatever. Um, or they just meet me out of the driveway and I don't have time to put my mask up or anything. And it, it happens. You know, I was taking a risk. And, and you know, thank goodness I, I didn't end up getting sick at all through this thing. But the, the, the risk was, was definitely there, and I had to keep on working through this whole thing. I didn't, I didn't have a choice to, to stay home. There's, there's no such thing as a, a, a Zoom delivery job yet. I mean, maybe one day. Maybe one day we'll do, they'll, they'll have just drone pilots, and, and that'll be the, the delivery worker job. And or we'll you just could operate sit at home. a 3D printer. Oh and yeah. Then somebody orders something and you just key it into the printer yeah. and then it like yeah, it projects it, to their make living it for room. Them right away. Like, there it is. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> sure. Once once we get like uh, Star Trek level technology and we can just beam things across the yeah. <laughs> but by that time there will be it will be completely post scarcity and no one will have to work at all and people will just be able to pursue whatever 
uh, you know, intellectual yeah. or whatever. Oh my gosh, could you imagine? Pursuits? Like people being able to like, trade their arts or their. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, oh my art gosh. would go crazy. I would. I'd be making terrariums all day. Yeah, I'd be. I'd be uh, planting food plants and 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 helping people build housing. I would do so many things if 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 I was just able to do whatever I want without uh, any fear of of uh, starving or or ending up destitute. You know. And I really think, too, like, I know this is a way back, but, like, talking about charity Mm -hmm. being a difficult thing. But then, okay, so, like, when you do something good for someone, Mm -hmm. it makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel good. And studies have shown that you're more likely to do something above and beyond for someone else later that same day or that same week. It's like the pay it forward sort of thing. Yeah. Like, it's just a good feeling. And to think if yeah. more people could operate on this system, don't you think the world would be a happier place? Absolutely. I don't think it's too idealistic to imagine a world where a lot of what you need every day is, is just based on, on mutual aid. Like, people, you telling people you have a need and, mm-hmm. and them saying, okay, I can fill that need. And then you seeing other people's needs and you going out and, and helping them. You know, it just it just has to be more interconnected on on a very local and, and personal level. I'm telling you the list. For a lot of things, the, what like, list? Com- like maybe oh, community oh, oh. swap board. Like, yeah, hey, yeah. I need this. That, or that, I want that. That's the beginnings. That's the beginnings of this interconnected network. It, it could be something as simple as that, or or what I've talked about uh, in previous videos. My idea of I call it stone soup socialism, which is basically the the idea of stone soup, where you know you bring out some soup and you just you go to a, a, a local park or wherever you happen to be where people gather or at least move by regularly and you don't make a big show of it or anything you just if people come up you, you dish them up a, a bowl of soup and uh, and that's that and you know you start to meet your neighbors you, it, it's a small thing and then eventually it can build into more where people you know you do it on a regular basis and you know and that people that share like, and people hey. Are like hey you know I, I just grew some amazing kale which i know is your favorite but <laughs> <laughs> but uh um but whatever you're like but whatever what what you know a really good point is you know we could make a really good tomato soup if, if we mm-hmm. all just pitched in together and like i got some salt i got some some really fresh you know heirloom tomatoes it's gonna make a really good uh uh, uh soup out of this out of mm-hmm. this sort of thing you know and and it becomes it just kind of builds on itself and then and then you start making these community connections um and and maybe you go from there maybe you're like hey well, you know you just just through naturally talking you're like hey how are you how are you guys living uh, and, oh I, I hate my landlord you know oh i hate my landlord too you know they they leave the vermin problems to for us to deal with they never fix anything they're just they're just squeezing us for everything we got you know, oh, well, well, you know, and maybe it gets to the point where, hey, what would you say about uh, the idea of getting together with, with the rest of the people in, in you know, our building or, or, or another building and uh, buying it out and making it into a uh, cooperative housing situation? You know, these things, they could spy, they, they could snowball from, from that, these little interactions that, that done with with the right intention you know you're not expecting anything back just by handing out soup to people you're not expecting any sort of even a tip or anything you're just doing it because it's the right thing to do you're helping out people whether or not you, and you're not sitting there like oh oh you you're dressed in a business suit you don't deserve the soup it's just whoever comes by you know mm-hmm. it's it's about it's about the connection part of it you build these little connections they form more connections and you do it you know intentionally and and you start small enough and it builds into more, and it, and and eventually you could end up with something really huge, where you have an entire community that, that knits itself together in a much more real, and and materially resilient way than they are currently, just from you know these sorts of small actions. And it could be it could be that way with anything. It could be that way with a community swap board or just. And I think too, just getting to know your community, your neighbors, and stuff yeah. better. I think that would also deter crime. Oh, for sure. Because people are going to be like, like if you know somebody Mm -hmm. or you know more people around, it's going to be less likely that you, oh, you might door ding someone's car and not, you know, drive off and not say anything so you don't get in trouble. Well, you look out for each other, you know, instead of that faceless person who may or may not live on my floor, it's, you know, 
uh, oh, uh, George or, or, or that's right Mindy from downstairs whatever. Yeah, yeah whatever you know you, you, it, you, you start by just the small things of putting a face to a name and eventually it's oh you know I saw someone you know sneaking around your car the other day and, and they looked like they might have been up to no good maybe they were trying to see if it was unlocked or something you, you just happen to mm-hmm. mention that to them because you've made that small connection these, these small connections are, every, everything starts somewhere and if you're feeling disconnected from everybody and everything, just reaching out to someone who's who's near you, for for little things, it could be, hey, you know, I got a package coming. You got a package. I won't be home. Can you let them in? Yeah, or? yeah. Or or even, can you believe the landlord hasn't plowed the lot yet? You know, mm-hmm. something something even that simple. We're thinking about filling in the potholes with some gravel from down the way. <laughs> that, that's something we've actually <laughs> thought about because. You know they're real good at they're real good at taking the money every month for those parking spaces. They're not so good about using it for anything. You know, it, it just somehow you know they got probably a hundred spaces and that's ten dollars a space every month and thousand dollars a month. Thousand dollars a month, even on <laughs> in, even on months where it snows two or three times, they're probably not putting that back into the plowing like- service. Twice this year, like a plowable. Wait, yeah, and they had yeah. a plow come once. Yeah, yeah. There, there were definitely even times where they just, they knew it was going to get warm enough that in you know half a week it's going to all melt away. So they right. just didn't so even we'll bother. Just leave it, <laughs> and you can just drive into your tire grooves from last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, good luck to you. But yeah, so so okay. it can start from small connections and it can build something more, and then that's the whole purpose of of this book really, is is. Talking about building the meaningful connections so that we all support each other. And, I mean, what is civilization if not people being interconnected, interdependent, and in a positive way, relying on one another uh, and, and, you know, building connections with one another. That's, that's what this is all about, really. It's about the connections. That's, that's what has drawn me to Kropotkin and, and anarcho-communism. More than anything, is at the root of it, it's connections. So we're almost done with the chapter. I think we should probably just kind of finish it out here, mm-hmm. and then we can uh, sum up with any any more thoughts we have lingering. Oh, yeah, we got uh, literally we have like 10 seconds left in the chapter. Let's just finish it out, and then we'll have some more thoughts. Oh. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. In fact, we're You can find more done. Audible Anarchist so. on YouTube. <laughs> you know. Didn't, didn't plan that one ahead of time or anything. This audio... All right, so that that concludes chapters 7 and 8. Uh, so we've, we've learned about clothing. We've learned about... Um, we've talked a little bit about labor practices. We've talked about how... Even in Kropotkin's time, because of the, the advent of the Industrial Revolution, people... If, if you look at the need in terms of how much people need in, for calories, for shelter, for you know maintenance of cities, for, for all the goods and services they need. Uh, and, you, and you then applied that to the number of hours that people work, would need to work to produce all that stuff. You're talking about part-time work, even in Kropotkin's time. And imagine how much more complex and how much more labor is, is been brought onto the shoulders of machinery in our time you know, how much could we really get away with with not working, each one of us, and still produce more than enough abundance in, in whatever you can think of for everybody? I would bet you that that, that's, that calculation would come out to even fewer hours today. And if not, like, what, what has all this industrialization been for? Right, you know, really? If it's not actually producing more for, for, for less human input. Mm-hmm something to consider so imagine what you do with all that extra time if suddenly you only had to work three or four hours a day to to do all the things you want think of all the pursuits you could uh go after you know maybe uh learn learn another language uh so you can reach out to other people in your community that that speak a language that you don't you could just hang out with your neighbors you know start these connections going you could uh plant a garden you could you do any of the, any number of things. You could stream on Twitch more often, make connections across the internet, across the world, bring in all sorts of opinions that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, to access. 
you could just do nothing with that time. You could take you could take the time to rest your body that, that all of us need. You could do yoga. Yeah. You could read books. You could meditate. It's, 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 it's endless, the things that you could do. You could do anything. Oh, I thought you didn't like that song. I don't. I hate it. It's awful. <laughs> I just put it in your head, haven't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the... the the little uh, man, you should go search this video out. It's it's really good. This is way far of a tangent, but uh, this little kid he's being interviewed on the show, and he just he stutters for a, a good twenty seconds about he's trying to say, "Have you ever had a dream where you could do anything that you wanted to do?" Basically, and basically a lucid dream where you had control over everything. But he's like, he it's just so, it's it's so adorable. He's like, "Have you ever have you ever had?" A, it, 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 he just keeps going on for twenty seconds, and he finally spits out. He's like, "You ever had a dream where you could do anything?" And he's so proud of himself when he finally gets to it. <laughs> and 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 what these people did was they they took that and they auto tuned it and turned it into this whole big song. It's a really beautiful and uplifting song, I think. I don't know why it annoys you so much, but I think it's I think it's wonderful. It's probably just the voice, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it's kind of weird when kids singing voice. He wasn't even singing; he was just speaking, mm-hmm. and they've auto tuned it to make it sound like he's speaking. So I guess that. I, I can see how for some that, that might come off creepy, but I think it's pretty awesome. I think if you're watching this as a YouTube video, I'm probably going to have a link to it uh, just because I don't want you to have to miss this sort of thing. It's, it's really that good in Zach's my opinion. Zach's really about keeping up with opportunities for things. What are you, what are you alluding to? <laughs> that you wouldn't want them to miss out on this incredible video. Yeah, yeah. Like, if you didn't get anything out of the, the chapter, uh, oh well, at, at least, least you can watch a cool video. you great song where you learn <laughs> no, that really, you really I, can I really, do I really hope, anything. <laughs> I really hope that you have gotten something out of, out of this chapter, or these two chapters, I should say, and, and our discussion of it. Um, I hope that you, uh, yeah, if you're watching this on YouTube, I hope you leave a comment. Uh, Yo, kiss cam. Who is this on here? One fitting. <laughs> I don't know if I want to make my channel go down that sort of a route where we're just we're just no. <laughs> doing that thing. Which what we're trying to keep it uh, professional. One here. fin. <laughs> Who is that? Uh, not someone I've seen before. Perhaps mm. they just found it because uh, I stream on the politics, uh, <laughs> and and most people don't use that tag when they stream or the the category of politics. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate the the uh, <laughs> the. You could pretend it happened, because yeah. you can do anything. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know that you've been in the chat for this time, so I could just tell you that, you know, it's already happened. You, you missed your chance. <laughs> oh, you found it on your politics. Cool. Well, <laughs> you've just come at the, the, the end of it, unfortunately. I hope you go back and, and take a look at some of my previous streams. I also am on YouTube under uh, Bread Theory. You can find me on Twitch at... Or, I'm sorry, at Twitter, at bread underscore theory. That's, that's where I am in, in most capacities. Um, I am on uh, Facebook, bread underscore theory. You can find me there too, as well as my groups that I manage, uh, Left Pod Posting, as well as Left Signal Boost. Uh, you can find out about all kinds of cool leftist projects through either of those channels. Um, did, did you have any questions here at the end? Uh, one Finnegarinda... Okay, I'm going to try this one again. One fin garindias. Did you have any questions here at the end uh, before we, we kind of wrap things up for the night? If not, that's okay, you know? One fin garindias. One fin garindias. That's, that's, that's an interesting name. It's a mouthful to start out, but uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure it means something it's cool, cool, right? <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. So yeah, so we learned about a, a bunch of cool things in the, these past couple of chapters. I think we um, gave you a bunch of things to consider about applying it to modern day life, uh, applying it, the ideas to permaculture. Um, start a union at st- your work. Start a union at your work, you know, and, and the difficulties of that because of the way that the system is, is set up to keep you always on the edge of, of exhaustion, never having quite enough time um, to even think about doing anything beyond surviving. Um, yeah. Any any other thoughts that are coming up at the end for you? Oh, I think I'm about to power down. To be honest. Yeah, I'm glad we started at seven o'clock. I think this is probably going to be our new time. I think that hits it right the sweet spot where I'm not waiting for an hour for for things to start because I've I've said it's going to be at a certain time. I think seven o'clock uh, Central Standard Time is going to be the new uh, the new time for for this particular stream. So look for us every Friday seven o'clock. 
Central Standard Time. That's uh, GMT minus six. I uh, don't know where everyone is from around the world. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, if you're finding this on YouTube and you have any questions, please leave a comment and I'll, I'll do my best. I, I check those comments pretty regularly. Uh, no matter where you find this, whether it's a podcast, I'm also on Anchor as, as Bread underscore Theory. Uh, I do my podcast there. I, I just put this, this stream out in podcast form. That's basically what it is. Um, so wherever you're finding me right now, if you, if, if, if you have the chance to leave a comment, go ahead. Otherwise... You can always find me on Facebook. Go to my page, Bread underscore Theory, there, and, and leave me a comment there. I post all my, my links there as well. Um, other than that, I think we'll probably wrap it up for the night, and we will look forward to Chapter 9 next week. Uh, and perhaps it'll be uh, Perennial Green again as my, my lovely co-host. Perhaps it'll be someone else. I kind of like to... Maybe. to uh, bring a, a variety of people on to get a variety of... of Perspectives. I always like getting a new perspective. So if you're watching this and you would like to come on the stream, uh, all you need to have, you don't have to have anything that you, you're plugging even. You don't have to have any background and leftist theory. All you need to have is an opinion on the subject matter and a willing to discuss it in good faith. You know, I don't want people coming on. This is not a debate stream, not not bringing in people just to, uh, to slow things down and derail discussion. I'm about discussion. I'm about... Productive discussion, even if you disagree, even if you're coming from a different perspective, as long as we can discuss things with with good faith. You and know, respect. And, and respect. I, I'd be happy to have you on. So if you're finding this and that sounds good to you, yeah, reach out to me through any of my various platforms. I'll, I'll check all of it. So, yeah, other than that, I think I'm going to find someone to rate into. So before I go, I just want to, to finish by saying uh, my, my catchphrase that, that I put at end, the end of every video, which is LECTAM. It's, a, it's an acronym. And uh, I think probably once I get done with the, the Conquest of Bread, I'll probably spend a few streams kind of going over some smaller stuff, including discussing what LECTAM stands for. So be excited, you know, get excited, looking forward to that sort of thing. Um, so until next time, friends, LECTAM. And I'm going to just... Oh, and I also... I'm sorry, I forget myself. I wanted to show you Perennial Green's uh, Twitch stream if you are interested in houseplants and crafts. That is definitely the stream to go to. She streams every Thursday night at 7.45. Am I correct mm -hmm. in that? Yep. Um, Everything is plant-related on my channel. Plant-related. plants or plant-related crafts. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you like growing things, um, she's definitely the person to talk to. Has a lot of experience now in houseplants.